All right, well, let's go ahead and begin together this morning. I want to welcome those of you who are watching at home, and I'd like to begin by reading from Matthew chapter 28. This is after the death and burial of Jesus. Matthew writes, Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb, with fear and great joy, and ran to tell his disciples. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave proclaims that Jesus is the Son of God and that Jesus saves. This is really the centerpiece of our faith. It is central to what we believe and to who we are as Christians. And this event of the, re of the resurrection is why Christians in every generation since the first century have gathered to worship today, on Sunday, which is the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, the day that Jesus rose from the grave. Today, we cannot get together physically. We cannot gather face-to-face -face as we would love to, as is the pattern in Scripture. But in, in God's providence, this is because we are facing some truly unusual circumstances. But None of that changes the fact that today is the Lord's day. Today is Sunday. This is the day that Jesus rose from the grave. And so it is the day that we set aside to worship Christ and to rejoice in his glorious grace. In times of adversity and in times of uncertainty, this time of worship is not less important. It is more important. Important. So let me invite you to sing these songs with us, to pray these prayers with us, and to open your hearts to receive the word, and let's worship our risen Savior together. Let the words of this psalmist in Psalm 146 encourage us, wherever we are, to raise our voices and sing from our hearts to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoner free. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said? For I 
the soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to its fold. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to this point in our service, we always take time to pray for the, the church of God around the world, and this morning we're going to take some time um, to pray together, to unite our hearts um, in prayer to God for our nation um, and for those who are being affected by um, the spread of the virus and, and um, to pray for God's mercy upon us and his provision. So bow your heads with me if you would. Our Father, this morning, we come before you, um, Lord, with thankfulness in our hearts because um, we know that you are uh, our stronghold 
uh, that you have removed for us uh, the sting of death and the power of death. And thank you for the hope that we can have because of Jesus Christ. Um, and I pray that that hope that we, um, that we have because of him, because of um, the redemption that we have through his blood, would shine out um, in this dark world um, at, this, at this time of, of fear and uncertainty. Uh, may you empower us as your church um, to spread the new, good news of the gospel. And Lord, we do pray for, um, for our country, for um, the local uh, city governments, for state uh, and federal uh, government um, that are making some difficult decisions right now. I pray that you would give our leaders, uh, whom you have appointed and provided for us, um, wisdom and compassion and guidance. Um, Lord, I pray that you would be with um, those who are in the healthcare care um, system right now who are tired and who are frightened and who are um, working to uh, uh, the maximum of their abilities. Might you provide them with um, supernatural strength and, and grace and mercy and sustain them. And for uh, the believers um, who are doctors and nurses and, and um, uh, that you would give to them your strength and your grace and your mercy that they might extend it to others who are in need right now. Um, Lord, we pray also for our law enforcement, um, for uh, emergency medical and fire um, volunteers. May you bless them in their work. Um, for those who are working in grocery stores and working long, long hours, for those who um, need um, child care, uh, for those who are educating at home and um, looking for, for strength and for answers, Lord, I pray that you would be near to us. You have said in your word that you are near to um, the brokenhearted. And Lord, may you turn our hearts in dependence and in faith to you at this time. Uh, Lord, may... Uh, you accomplish uh, your good purposes through this whole situation, and may your people place their confidence and faith in you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. From Romans in chapter 8. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's sing together, yet not I, but through Christ in me. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold. My hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to Him. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. I 
light is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stand. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need, His power is displayed. To this I I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised. to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home, and day by day I know he will renew me, until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hope, my hope is all. by greeting each one of you who are watching at home today. We greet you as our brothers and sisters in Christ. We greet you as friends. We have to turn this on. I'm going to try that again. Forgot to turn the microphone on. I want to begin uh, our time in the Word together by first of all greeting each one of you who are watching at home today. We greet you as brothers and sisters in Christ. We greet you as our friends and as our spiritual family. You are loved by God and loved by us as well. And I am glad that you have chosen to set aside some time on Sunday morning to join in worship with us and to turn your attention to Jesus Christ. I also want to thank um, and just acknowledge those who are present this morning. There are 10 of us exactly here in the room this morning. Uh, my wife and, and my four children are here. And then as you already saw, uh, Carrie Wilson. Thank you, Carrie, for coming and for leading us in worship. Uh, Jacob Buss is here using his 
uh, musical gifts to serve us as well. And then a very big thank you to Bryce Miller, his wife Allison. Bryce is really uh, the mastermind behind getting a lot of this video stuff set up. So we're very thankful to Bryce and his wife for how you both are serving us this morning. Um, obviously, this online format for our Sunday gathering is less than ideal, but it is a good thing. It is a good thing that we can participate in and a good thing that we ought to be thankful for. When I first learned that we were not going to be able to gather physically and that we would need to be doing something like this, I almost immediately thought of Paul's words in Colossians chapter 2, verse 5. Paul writes, For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Absent in body, but with you in spirit. There is no substitute for the church gathered. But there is still a kind of spiritual unity that we possess as brothers and sisters in Christ. And though we cannot gather together, we still must hold high the priority of pursuing this increasing firmness of faith in Christ. So it is our prayer that um, this time, as we are together in spirit, connected online, that this time would strengthen our faith in Christ, that it would feed our souls with the truth of God's word, and that God would use this imperfect form of Sunday worship to meet our need in this season. I'm going to ask you this morning to open your Bibles to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Last week, we stepped away from our series through the book of James, and I preached a message from Psalm 46 in light of the rapidly developing and, uh, and rapidly changing coronavirus situation. And if you were not able to be there for that sermon, or if you're not able to listen to that later online, I want to encourage you to please go do that because there's some very important perspective that Psalm 46 gives us. Um, Psalm 46 tells us that we need not be afraid because God is our refuge and our strength and he is with us. So we will not fear. So that's really forming our perspective and our response to everything that's going on in our society right now. And one of the ways that we can show that we are not afraid, one of the ways that we can show that God is our refuge and we are confident in his powerful presence with us is by fighting to keep as much normalcy as possible. And so that's why I want to go back to the book of James today. Because that's what we would be doing if we could all get together as usual at the Carnegie Building. So there may be a need at some point um, to, to change uh, our focus in our, in our teaching time in order to respond to new challenges that arise. But for today, I want to keep studying James and to consider how God would speak to us today. He knew we would be in the book of James and he knew we would be facing these circumstances. So let's open our hearts to listen to him. James chapter 1, and our text for this morning is verse 22 through 27. James writes, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away, and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Heavenly Father, as we open your word this morning, although we are scattered and in various places today, we ask that your spirit, who is present with each of us, would take the truth of scripture, illuminate it to our minds, apply it to our hearts, and change our lives so that we might glorify you. I pray, God, that you would correct our, our thinking today, that you would reorient our desires and that you would fill us with your grace, that we might be strengthened to obey all that you command. So, Father, speak to us today through your word and by your spirit. 
We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior. Amen. I want to ask you a question this morning. Have you ever thought about starting to work out? I know I have. Maybe around New Year's. Or, or put it this way, if you're a student, have you ever thought about studying? You've thought, wow, I really need to spend some time studying Tuesday night so I can be prepared for that exam. Or maybe some of you have thought about starting to floss as a daily habit. Have you guys ever thought about doing some good things like that, some important things like that? We are all, many of us, full of good intentions, aren't we? But when you take your midterm exams, whether you're a KU or whether you're in elementary school or wherever you're at, when you take a test, it doesn't matter how much you thought about studying, does it? It, it doesn't matter how much you planned to get out your books and review your notes. Your grade depends on whether you actually studied, doesn't it? When you tell your doctor that, yeah, doctor, I knew that my cholesterol was high and I really had planned to start working out and watching what I eat, that won't make any difference if you didn't actually do it. When you sit in the dentist chair, it won't matter that you generally approve of flossing. It won't matter if you own 12 different flavors and colors of floss there in your bathroom. It doesn't even matter if you tell your kids that it's good to floss and you should go floss your teeth. If you don't actually unwind a few inches and apply it to your teeth and gums, your dentist will know and he will not be impressed. We are easily convinced, aren't we, that we are good Christians because we know what's in the Bible, because we've read it, because we understand it, because we think that it's true. But does our knowledge of God's word translate into action? Do we do what the word says? We can recite the benefits of reading scripture, but do we read it? We can explain what it means to love our neighbor, but is there a track record in our lives of sacrificial service to others? We can vigorously affirm the importance of evangelism, and we can have deep thoughts about the centrality of the church in God's mission. But are we adding momentum to the Great Commission? You see, it's possible, James tells us, to be a hearer of the word, but not a doer. And God is not impressed. James has a point to make in this book, that genuine faith affects everything. And this includes how we respond to the word of God. A few weeks ago, uh, last time we were in the book of James, we saw that we are instructed and commanded to receive the word with meekness. That's verse 21. Before we are instructed to do the word, verse 22, and instructed to submit to the law, verse 25, God, first of all, addresses the state of our hearts, doesn't he? It always starts there. If our hearts are not meek and receptive to what God has to say to us, then the battle is really lost even before it starts. But James wants to make sure we know that there is more to receiving the word than simply being quick to hear it. Truly receiving the word requires doing what the word says. James insists that actively responding in obedience to the word of God is an essential expression of true religion. An active response of obedience to the word of God is an essential expression of true and authentic religion. Why is it so important that we respond in obedience to God's word? I want to share with you this morning three reasons that James gives us in his text. The first we find in verses 22 through 24, and it's this. We must respond in obedience to the word because a failure to obey reveals a false self-perception. Failure to obey reveals a false self-perception. He says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. It's easy to feel spiritual when we hear spiritual truth. But James pulls the rug out from under our feet and tells us that if we listen but never respond, we've not fully received the word and we are deceiving ourselves. Verses 23 through 24 illustrate very clearly the foolishness of this kind of thinking. Hearing the word but not responding is like walking away from a mirror 
and completely forgetting what you've seen. If that describes you, if you look in the mirror and walk away and forget what you've seen, James says that you don't have an accurate understanding of your own appearance. You've forgotten what you saw. In a similar way, hearing the word points out flaws in our life, doesn't it? It it points out things that need to change. It gives us instruction that we must respond to. But when we don't respond obediently, then the truth of God's word, something that should have had a transforming effect on us, has been ignored and it's been wasted. We walk away thinking something's been accomplished because we've heard. When in reality, it has not been accomplished. This is deception. You might ask, what does it mean to be deceived? What is the nature of this deception? I think there's various levels to the degree to which we can be deceived. If you hear and do not respond in obedience, you might think that you are wise when in reality you are not. Wisdom is shown in how we walk, isn't it? You might be deceived because you think you are growing, but you are not. Growth is demonstrated when we bear fruit, isn't it? You might be deceived by thinking that you are spiritually mature, but you are not. There's more to spiritual maturity than simply knowledge and simply hearing what is true. And in some cases, and most concerning, You might even think that you are saved, that you have been born again, that you know Christ, that you are spiritually alive, that you've been made right with God, but in reality, you are not. And that kind of deception is spiritually deadly. Look back in verse 21 with me. He says that we ought to put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word of, Notice this, which is able to save your souls. How do we experience salvation? We receive with meekness the word. We believe by faith the truth of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. The good news of the gospel that comes to us from the pages of scripture. That is the only way to salvation. He says that this word is able to save our souls, but then in the very next verse, he says if we don't hear it, or rather if we don't do it after hearing it, then we have deceived ourselves. And it's possible that this deception might be so complete that we think our souls have been saved, when in reality, they have not. One who does not respond to the word in obedience shows that he's not fully received it. James later will tell us that faith without works is dead. It's useless. It cannot save you. Now, to be clear, even here in James, we see that it is the power of the word. It is the truth of the gospel that saves us. Look in verse 18. It says that God brought us forth by the word of truth, not by our obedience and our good works. And in verse 21, it's the implanted word which is able to save us. It's not our good works and our obedience that has the power to save us. So we must get this straight. Obedience does not secure our standing. It confirms our standing. Obedience does not secure our standing before God. It does not save us. It confirms our standing before God. It gives evidence that we are saved. And there's a very big difference between those two. Basically, you can illustrate it this way. Where there is smoke, there is fire, right? God's grace is the fire. It is his work through his word, by the power of his spirit, because of what Jesus accomplished in his death and resurrection. That is what saves us. That is the fire. But our obedience is the smoke that shows the fire is there, that it's present. Now, at no time do any of us obey the word perfectly, do we? First John tells us, if any of us claims that we have no sin, that's another way to deceive ourselves. It shows the truth is not in us. But it is possible, my friends, to do what the word says consistently and faithfully, even if we cannot do it perfectly. James's concern is that if you don't respond at all to the word, if there is no obedience, James says, then you have a big problem. You are deceived. Actively responding in obedience protects us from this false self 
perception. It gives evidence that we are truly receiving the word as we respond to it. Here's the second reason, verse 25. Actively responding in obedience results in blessing. This is why it's so important for us to do what the word says. He says this, verse 25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Obedience results in blessing. James has already told us that every good thing, every good and perfect gift comes from who? It comes from above, right? From the Father of lights. That's verse 17. Here we are invited to come and experience this blessing, to receive blessing from God. As we look into God's word and as we persevere in our obedience, we live life the way that God intended us to live. And we enjoy the blessings that come with that obedience. You might say, what is this blessing that James is referring to? What does he mean? Well, we have to be clear that James is not using the word blessing, perhaps in the way the world might use the term blessing. This is not a guarantee that you'll have all the money you could ever want. This is not a guarantee that you'll have success at everything you put your hand to. And it is not a guarantee that you'll have a good reputation and be loved and accepted by everyone around you. No, the blessing that James has in mind is different than the way the world would define blessing. Through obedience, we come to enjoy the blessings, first of all, of assurance and peace. Like we already pointed out, it's obedience that gives evidence that we truly do belong to God, that we are his children, that we are alive, that we're saved. That brings much assurance and peace, and that is a blessing, a blessing to be sought and enjoyed. We also receive the blessing of joy, knowing that God delights in our obedience. Get this, you are accepted by God because of Christ. You are made righteous and forgiven of sin and adopted into his family. That is complete and finished. But did you know that God is pleased when his children obey him? That God genuinely delights in your prayers and in your obedience? He is pleased when you say no to sin and when you say yes to the Holy Spirit? That pleases God, and there is real joy in knowing that God is pleased by our imperfect but true obedience. There's joy. There's also the blessing of the Spirit's presence and help. When you seek to do the will of God, He aids you. He gives you power. He gives you strength. He gives you grace through His Holy Spirit, and that is a blessing. As James will tell us later, God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. When we refuse to obey God's word, that is the essence of pride, to say that I know better than God. And when I say that I know better than God, that pretty much guarantees God is going to be opposing me. But when I humble myself before him and obey his word, I receive blessing. I experience grace. That is a blessing that is there for us. And I think ultimately James has in mind the blessing of future reward. Flip back to verse 12 in chapter 1. James has already told us, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. There is a future reward coming. You may not see it in this life, but when Jesus returns, when his kingdom is established, there's going to be a reward and a blessing for those who obeyed. And that is something we should reach for in faith. These are the blessings promised to those who look into the word, who hear what it says, and then do what it says obediently. There's an interesting phrase here that's unique to James. He says, that we are looking into the law of liberty. That's an interesting phrase, this perfect law, the law of liberty. The law that he refers to here, I think, has in mind more than just the Old Testament law, more than just the first five books of the Bible, the the law of Moses. And this is really shorthand for scripture in general. It reminds me of Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is a long extended song that celebrates the beauty and the power and the truth and the glory of God's word. 
And it begins with these words, blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. James isn't saying anything new, that there's blessing for those who walk in God's law. But law and liberty almost seem contradictory to us, don't they? Because law seems to restrict freedom. Liberty means freedom. How do these things go together? We naturally think of law as being restrictive or cold or limiting. But James says that this law is perfect. It is the perfect law. And he says it's the law of liberty. Biblically speaking, when we walk in obedience to God, we will experience life in its fullest. Life as God intended it to be. It guides us away from enslaving and soul-destroying sins. It guides us away from from restrictive and crippling anxiety. It it guides us away from a life that, that fails to enjoy the fullness of God's blessings that he's promised. It guides us towards life as God designed it, a life that is designed for our good. From our human perspective, shaped by the wisdom of the world, this at first seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? Law and liberty, because we think of freedom being the absence of law, getting to do whatever I want to do. But scripture reveals that living under God's law is the essence of real freedom. That is liberty. The Bible is full of these seeming paradoxes, isn't it? Whoever saves his life will what? Lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake in the gospel will find it. The first will be what? Last. And the last will be first. And here in James, we see that the law is actually what brings us liberty. A paradoxical but wonderful truth. I think Jesus describes it this way in John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. He says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. You see, Jesus Christ sets us free. Free indeed from slavery to sin. Jesus sets us free from the permanency of death. Jesus brings freedom from the grip of fear. And as we abide in his word, That means we obey what he says to us in the scriptures. We live in the realm of this freedom. The perfect law of liberty is the truth about the son, the one who makes us free indeed. It's the life-giving message of the gospel, the power of God through his son Jesus to set us free. Our first step of obedience to this law is simply to repent of our sins and trust in Jesus Christ as the one who can make us free. And James is simply pointing out that every step after that is likewise to be ordered by God's word. We trust in Jesus to save us, and then we follow Jesus till the day of our death or his return. But notice that this response of obedience to to doing what the law says, it's a response that must be sustained. He says that this is for those who persevere. He says the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. There's a very important truth for us in these words. That temporary obedience is no formula for blessing. Temporary obedience is no formula for blessing. I think a lot of times we, we think, or we maybe even say, you know, I tried doing what the Bible says, but it didn't work. So I'm going to try something else. But let me just share some perspective. If you tried it and it didn't work, 
Maybe that's because you wanted different results than what God wanted. Or maybe it's because you did not persevere in your obedience. The obedience that brings blessing is a sustained obedience. We continue to follow Christ. We continue to abide by his word. We continue to do what the word reveals. Temporary response is not true obedience. We must be doing, in an ongoing sense, what the word says. Actively responding in obedience positions us to receive God's blessing. But there's a third reason why responding in obedience is so important, and it's this. We find it in verses 26 through 27. Actively responding in obedience produces genuine expressions of devotion to God. It produces genuine expressions of devotion to God. Look in verses 26 and 27. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. These verses use a term that a lot of times we don't use in the church today, and it's a term that leaves a bad taste in many people's mouths. It's the word religion. Religion. A lot of people think of religion as a negative thing. And, and we think of it as a negative thing because we associate the word religion with outward hypocrisy or with human efforts, or with empty rituals that don't actually have any spiritual value. Maybe you've heard people say, perhaps you've even said, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. Trying to point people away from empty external forms and towards an authentic, spiritual, dynamic relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and I understand that sentiment. But the word religion here in this context is not a negative word. It's a generic word that simply means how we express our devotion to God. Really, this word is very close to the idea of worship. True worship, authentic worship, genuine religion. This refers to the things that we do out of a desire to please God and to express our love to him. Is it a good thing to show our love for God? Yes. Is it a good thing to express devotion to Jesus Christ and to serve him with our life? Yes, that is what we are called to do. And that's what James is meaning when he refers here to religion. It's a lifestyle that proceeds from what we say that we believe. So it's a positive term in this context. And first of all, James tells us in verse 26 that if you think you are religious... If you think that you love God and you think that you're living a life that is pleasing to him, but you're stuck in a sinful pattern of behavior, like, for instance, not bridling your tongue, then James says that pattern that ignores the clear commands of Scripture shows that that's not true and God-honoring religion. If you think you're religious, but you have un uh, uninterrupted patterns of sin, like not bridling your tongue, then that sort of religion is worthless. It's worthless. An unbridled tongue, the example that James uses here, evidences foolishness. It shows a lack of self-control, and it leads to no shortage of sins. Proverbs 10, verse 19 says, When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. A pattern of sinful, fleshly, foolish behavior is not what true religion looks like. That's not what pleases God. That's not how we evidence a heart of genuine worship and love for Christ. But James also goes on in a positive sense to show us what true expressions of devotion to God do look like. So it doesn't look like these patterns of sin that are unchecked. What does it look like? Look in verse 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the kind that pleases him, the kind that is genuine, he says it's this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. James says that true religion, 
the kind of devotion to God that pleases him, first of all, looks like active compassion towards the needs of others. He uses the example here of of ministering to widows and orphans, those who were helpless and had real needs in that society. Ministering to the helpless, serving the needy and helping them is a sign that our heart is aligned with God's heart. Because God is a God of compassion, isn't he? God is a God who shows mercy. God is a God who generously provides. Psalm 68 verse 5 says, that he is the father of the fatherless. Protector of the widows is God in his holy habitation. James tells us that true and genuine religion that pleases God, it's the overflow of a heart that is aligned with God's. God is compassionate towards the helpless and the oppressed. So someone who has received the word, someone who's being conformed to the image of Christ, will have a heart that has been transformed by the truth of this word, a heart that is aligned with God's heart, a will that is submitted to God's will, desires that mirror God's desires, goals that are wrapped up in God's goals. You cannot claim to love God if you ignore the people that God loves. But you also cannot claim to love God if you love what he hates. Notice this, not only does he say that we are to to reflect the heart of God in showing compassion and meeting needs, but he also says, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Love for God is demonstrated in a persistent purity as we seek to resist worldliness. He says we're to keep ourselves unstained from the world. What does that mean? What is the world? Does this mean that we need to retreat from society? I know right now we have to quarantine, but let's say that all of this, you know, is is over, hopefully sooner than later. To keep ourselves unstained from the world, does that mean we have to hide or that we need to try to be as alien and as different as possible from all the people around us? No. Listen to what the Apostle John says about the world. 1 John 2, 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. When James refers to keeping ourselves unstained from the world, what he means is that is that the desires of the flesh find no foothold in us, that the desires of the eyes are battled against, coveting, wanting things that aren't ours, and the pride of life, that, that obsession to be admired or, or respected or approved of by others, that ego that we have, that we don't allow ourselves to be consumed with feeding our own ego. That's how the world lives. That is how the world operates. That's what the world values. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the desire, the the pride of life. Those are the things that are not from the Father, but are from the world. And we are to seek to keep ourselves unstained by such sins. To keep ourselves free from the defiling presence of these sins. That That is a crucial way in which we express our devotion to God. That's true religion. It looks like holiness. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 and 14 says, According to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. We are to be diligent to be found by our Savior Jesus Christ when he returns without spot, without blemish. True love for Christ, a true response to his gospel and to the promise that he is returning should motivate us towards holiness, to keep ourselves unstained from the world. Often we are uncomfortable talking about holiness 
We get nervous because we're afraid of, of sounding legalistic or, or straying too close to legalism, thinking that if we emphasize holiness, if we emphasize purity, and if we denounce sin and, and promote an urgent battle against sin, that somehow we might minimize God's grace or undermine the gospel or make the redemptive work of Christ somehow pushed to the side and that will teach people to be Pharisees. But scripture is clear that we must pursue holiness, that we must do good works, that we must show mercy and compassion. Now we know that these things will not, they cannot save anyone. They never have and they never will. Good works and a holy life will not make you acceptable before God. It will not earn his love. It cannot earn his forgiveness. But these things are still necessary as proof that you have received forgiveness, as evidence that God is at work in your life, that you have been accepted by him, that he has made you new. So we need not minimize what James is saying and calling us towards good works and holiness. We do this at the same time that we hold up the sufficiency of Christ as a Savior, the exclusivity of Christ, the centrality of the gospel. And we simply show people that to believe and respond to this gospel in faith should produce certain results. Actively responding in obedience is an essential expression of true religion. It produces genuine expressions of devotion to God like compassion and sacrifice for the good of others and a persistent purity that seeks to keep ourselves unstained from the world. So let me ask, how about you? As we read through verses 22 through 27, how does that land on you this morning? What is your response to the word? Are you someone who is eager to receive what God says in his word? Are you someone who is quick to obey when God's word is made clear? Or have you fallen into the trap of sort of just putting in your time on Sunday morning, listening to a sermon, maybe even reading your Bible a couple times during the week, and then going away and forgetting what you have seen in the mirror of God's word? forgetting the commands that God has made clear, forgetting the conviction of the Holy Spirit that has exposed sins that need to be put away. What is your response to the word of God? Do you show your compassion to those who are in need? We may have opportunities to do that in the very near future. Uh, Our economy and the, the lives of individual people is going to be disrupted. It is being disrupted right now. We may not have an overabundance of orphans and widows. We have some in our church, but we may have others who have genuine needs. Are you prepared to show compassion, to show mercy, and to help meet those needs as a reflection of the heart of God who saw our deepest need, a need for salvation, and did not withhold his only son from us? Are you prepared to love others in that way? Or do you instead show that you have other values. Rather than valuing what God values, you value other things. Friends, we have an opportunity, a real opportunity. Uh, One opportunity I think that we have is we are all sort of stuck at home during this time. Uh, And and this reminds me specifically, James's language about the unbridled tongue. It's often easiest for us to show compassion and to show restraint with our words and to be gracious with our speech to those who are outside our home. The hardest people to be gracious and compassionate to is often our husbands, our wives, our children, our brothers, and our sisters. You might be saying, how can we apply all these things because we can't even be with other people right now? Why don't we just work on applying this with the people in our home? Let's seek to, to show mercy and compassion to meet the needs, and to serve other people in our houses, even our little brothers and sisters, even your older brother or sister, even your kids, even your parents. Let's look for ways to to be obedient to God's word in our own home, and let's practice that so that when we get a chance to leave our home, 
We've been building this new pattern of serving and, and showing compassion and sacrificing for others. Let me ask you, in light of what James says about keeping ourselves unstained from, from the world, what priority do you place on personal holiness? How serious are you about saying no to sin and keeping yourself unstained from the world? Are you willing to take steps to, to be holy, to be like Christ? You know, during this, this sort of shutdown where everybody's stuck at home a lot, there's going to be a lot of um, looking for entertainment, ways to pass the time. Do you show by your entertainment diet that you love what the world loves? Is passing the time and escaping boredom so important to you that you're willing to allow yourself to ingest sinful things that will stain you? This may sound legalistic to you, but I think we need to take seriously what it is that we watch in our homes. Television or movies or Netflix, whatever it may be. The music that we listen to. Not trying to draw artificial lines in the sand. I'm just saying it is a biblical priority to keep ourselves unstained from the world. And some of us aren't serious enough about that. And we need to be. We need to be. There is much opportunity to apply in our lives, even stuck at home, the truths that James makes clear in this text. As you've been listening to all of this today, you've been hearing the commands of Scripture and hearing the prohibitions as well. Perhaps you feel a little bit overwhelmed. Perhaps you're very aware right now of your failure to do everything that God says in His Word. You know that you've heard it, and you also know that you've not obeyed it. Perhaps the blessing promised by God for those who persevere in obedience, perhaps that seems hopelessly out of reach to you. Perhaps you're feeling the sting of guilt right now for an unbridled tongue or for missed opportunities to serve others or the stain of worldliness that is right now present in your life. If that describes you, I have good news for you this morning. Let, re- let me remind you today of Jesus. Let, re- re- let me remind you of the one who perfectly kept God's law, perfectly fulfilled the law of God. Jesus is the one who persevered to the end in his active obedience, suffering on the cross, carrying it all the way to Calvary, and there on that cross, Jesus endured the shame and the suffering that we deserved. He took the stain of the world, the curse of sin, and he bore it upon his shoulders. Jesus paid the penalty for our sinful words, for our selfish ways, for our impurities and our failures and our weaknesses and even our lack of obedience, our disobedience to God's word. And this same Jesus, the one who fulfilled the law, the one who pays our debt on the cross, he invites you to come to him today if you are weary and find rest for your soul. Come to him today if you are guilty and find comfort for your burdened conscience. Come to him today if you are defiled by sin and he will cleanse you. Come to him today and find freedom from sin and confidence to stand before God with clean hands and a pure heart because you've knelt at the foot of the cross and received the grace of Christ. My friend, you can never resolve just to try harder and work harder and do better. If you try to please God on your own, if you try to just be really, really good at obeying all by yourself, if you're not trusting in Christ and not depending on his spirit, then you will fall and you will fail. But if you have put the full weight of your trust in Christ, trusting in God's promise to make you righteous through faith in Christ. If you have received the full measure of his saving grace, then you will hear the words of James today, not as a burden to keep the law, but you will hear it as an invitation to live for the one who loves you 
and to experience his blessing. To live for the one who gave himself for you to secure that blessing. And you will pursue obedience, not as a means of earning God's approval, but as an expression of true devotion to Christ. Genuine religion, a heart and a life of worship that pleases God. Actively responding in obedience to the word of God, James tells us, is an essential expression of true religion. It protects us from a false self-perception. It brings blessing, and it's a valuable, genuine expression of devotion to God. James really contrasts two kinds of people here in this text. Those who are deceived and whose religion is worthless, and secondly, those who obey and are blessed. If you need Christ today, if you do not have a saving relationship with Jesus, then what you need to do today in response to the word is repent of your sin and believe in Jesus Christ. Trust in the promise of the gospel. If you are a true believer, then let us seek to persevere in our obedience until we reach the eternal blessing that is promised to us because of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, as we look into your word, we have heard today what is true. You have shown us today what your will is. And I trust, Lord, that you have used the light of your word to shine into our hearts, that we have looked into a mirror today. And God, for everyone who is listening, whether present in this room or scattered in different places around our region today, I ask God that you would use your word to shine light and that we would see exactly what it is that you wish for us to do. I pray, God, that you would inspire obedience. Lord, protect us from attempting to obey your commands on our own, in our own strength, apart from your spirit. Protect us from ever thinking that our obedience somehow earns your love or earns our salvation. But God, I also ask that you'd protect us from ever thinking that because we've accepted Christ and believed in the gospel, that obedience and holiness are somehow not necessary. Lord, make us a church of people who demonstrate genuine, authentic religion, hearts that are devoted to worshiping you and pleasing you. And Lord, for those who may be listening today, maybe they're part of our church, maybe they're not part of our church, but you have brought them to this stream and they're listening right now. I pray, God, for those who are not saved, who feel the conviction of your spirit. They feel the weight of the law bearing down upon them. I pray that they would cry out to Jesus Christ in faith, that they would find salvation and righteousness in him. Lord, we know we cannot ever make ourselves righteous, but we are made righteous, declared righteous through faith. In Jesus, the one who loved us, who lived a perfect life in our place, who died a sacrificial death in our place, and who rose again to secure eternal blessing for all who believe. Lord, we believe that gospel. Bring others to trust in it and strengthen our hope in that gospel. And I pray that our lives would demonstrate continuing obedience and change all for your glory. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. In response to the truth of God's word that we've heard from James and the claim uh, that the Lord Jesus lays upon our life and our obedience, let us sing as a prayer from our hearts to the Lord, take my life and let it be. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to me. Take 
This morning, we, um, we ask that um, as we meditate on these truths, and Lord, we are um, impressed upon our hearts with um, the fact that we are bought with a price, that we are not our own, and that we, we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, um, and yet we seek your Spirit's help to submit ourselves to this truth. Um, Lord, may you be um, constantly at work um, in my heart, in the hearts of all of us uh, who are a part of the body of Christ, to be removing idols, um, to be uh, turning us to you uh, in submission, and to be showing kindness and compassion for one another, especially at a time such as this. Lord, may your word break up the fallow ground of our hearts. May we be sensitive to it and submitted uh, to the lordship of your son, Jesus Christ. We ask it in his name. Amen. Again, uh, thank you to all of you who joined us this morning. I hope that your hearts were refreshed and that you were encouraged and that God's word was clear for you. Um, again, for those of you who are part of our church, Redemption Hill Church, we are not able to meet, but we do want to keep um, communication going. If you're not part of our church email list, please let me know. Uh, y if you have a church directory, you can send me a text or call me or send me an email. If you don't have my contact information, my email address is jd.summers at rhlawrence.org. So please let me know and we will put you on our email list. That way you can be getting weekly communication in regards to worship and small groups and different things like that. Uh, we sent out information for our small groups this last week. We plan to do that again. Because our small groups can't meet together, what we're asking people to do is either as a family or just a couple people get together, uh, go through the questions that we send out, discuss this sermon together, and pray together. Uh, and if you can't get together with someone, make a phone call, 
send a text. Those are ways that we can reach out to and care for one another in times like this. I am praying for each of you as part of our church. Please join me in praying for the unity of this church and praying for God's grace as we face the challenges ahead. But we're going to close this morning with this blessing from Romans chapter 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Amen.